Good day, everyone. Welcome once again to Education 505 Research Seminar and Practicum. In this video lecture, I will discuss the topic, how to write the statements of the problem in research. And this video lecture is part of a series of video lectures on how to write a thesis or dissertation proposal as a final requirements of the course. Again, research seminar and practicum. And as you can see, in the first slide, there are three major points that I would like to discuss in this video lecture. The first one is the meaning, nature, and dynamics of the statements of the problem. Here, I will very briefly explain to you what really is the statement of the problem and what is its nature and dynamics. I need to present this to do so that you to you so that you will be able to fully make sense of what really is a statement of the problem before I talk about some of the techniques in formulating the statement of the problem. And the second major point in the outline is um, some techniques in formulating the statement of the problem. And so in this part, I will briefly discuss to you the steps, some of the recommended recommended steps or yeah, steps in, in, in the process of formulating your statements of the problem. And then the third uh, point in the outline um, is a presentation and discussion of samples of statements of the problem. So this is um, uh, a bit lengthy discussion on, um, on a concrete example of of a statement of the problem. So the bulk of the discussion for this video lecture will center on, on the samples of the statement of the problem. I will present two samples later. So let's start. But before anything else, before I proceed to the discussion on the meaning, nature, and dynamics of a statement of the problem, I wish to do a side discussion on the common mistakes that young scholars, masters and PhD students and undergraduate students, senior high school students included, commit in formulating the statement of the problem of their research. And as I observe in the country, I notice that even instructors, teachers in research commit this common mistake. So what is this mistake? I will present three samples of a statement of the problem that is that are framed incorrectly. So the first one is this statement of the problem. Second is I will also second is this and this one. So before I read the three of them, I will please take note that this is not the proper way of framing the statements of the problem. I repeat, I need to emphasize this one because this is the common mistakes again of, of young scholars, senior high school, undergraduate students, masters, PhD students, and even some teachers and, and instructors in research in the Philippines commit. So again, this is not the proper way of framing the statements of the problem. This is the incorrect way of framing the statement of the problem. For example, it reads, statement of the problem, there's a title of the subsection in the research proposal or the first part of the thesis or dissertation. It reads, this study aims to conceptualize and comprehend the lived experiences of student entrepreneurs. Specifically, this study seeks to answer the following questions. So we have question number one, what is the profile of the respondents in terms of name, age, sex, gen or gender, year level, parents, occupation, family, general, monthly income and expenses, number of family members, and rank in the siblings or family. And then we have the second question, how did they become young student entrepreneurs? What influences them to do so? What is, what is their perception on being a student entrepreneur? What is their academic performance? Fifth, what are the challenges encountered by the respondents? And sixth, what they have, 
what have they learned learned in the process of handling their business how they they apply this in their daily lives before i proceed to the second sample of an incorrect statement of the problem let me emphasize this point as well that this are or this section of your thesis or dissertation is supposed to be the research question or the articulation of the research questions. This is not the statement of the problem. So take notes, the statements of this problem is not the same with the research questions. Research young scholars, fledgling scholars tend to collapse the two, tend to equate the two. And so, yeah, they thought that this is the statement of the problem. I always reiterate this to my students that we need to correct bad practices in research, not just in research, but, but also in our profession as teachers, as professors, because look, we have the cliche that goes, if medical doctors commit mistakes, there's no problem, we bury the patient. If lawyers commit mistakes, there's no problem, you know, the client goes to prison. But the trouble with us teachers, professors, when we commit mistakes, we multiply it. And so this mistake has been there for quite some time already in our educational system. And I think it's about time that we have to correct it. So again, this is not the statement of the problem. This is the articulation of the research questions. So later on, I will provide when I, when I, uh, when I, uh, in the last part of this, in the third part or last part of this video lecture, I will present two samples of the statement of the problem so that you will understand me fully. Okay. We have another sample of an incorrect statement of the problem. This is actually the statement of the problem of my advisee, but I told her this is not a proper way of doing it. We will correct this soon. Of course, she will correct it soon. It reads, this proposed study aims to determine the lived experiences of grade 10 students who have mathematical anxiety in Gran Akalinawa National High School. Specifically, the study is guided by the following questions. What are the difficulties and challenges that said students have been facing? And question number two, what are the factors that contribute to the development of mathematical anxiety among respondents? And then we have here um, the third sample of an incorrect statement of the problem. It reads, this research has a chief concern regarding the primary factors affecting the performance and condition of different car engines. To obtain all the essential knowledge, data, and information, the research sought to answer the crucial questions as follows. One, what are the factors affecting the performance and condition of the type of engines given below? Like spark ignition engine, compression ignition engine, and non-combustion combustion kit engine. Question number two, what are the factors that car drivers commonly observe? And three, what are the observable, observable signs that help recognize that car engines are beginning to fail? So again, um, this th these three examples of a statement of the problem are, are samples of incorrect statement of the problem. Because again, these are research questions. Okay? You will understand me later when I go to when I go to the third part. So, um, so with that caveat, at least some of you know that what your colleagues and friends and what you have done in the undergrad, if you do, uh, um, if you did um, uh, research or a thesis in, in the undergrad, was actually incorrect. Okay? So let me proceed now to um, the first part, first major part of, of this video lecture. So what the statement of the problem really is, if those three samples that I have just shared with you are incorrect or are incorrectly framed, because again and again and again, they are not called statement of the problem, they are called research questions. So what the statement of the problem really is, the statement, um, I, I wrote, by the way, please know that I wrote my notes here. So what I will do, just like in my other video lectures, I will read my notes and do some side discussions if necessary so that I won't uh, miss, 
I won't miss any important points. And so that I will be able to present my discussion in a coherent and logical manner. So the statements of the problem is the brief explanation of the problem or gap that the researcher wants to see addressed in a research. And please take note that as I discussed in my other two, in my other two video lectures titled Problem Formulation and Research Gap Spotting. By the way, if you are um, uh, doing research, please take note that the, the very first step in conducting research is the identification of your research gap or the formulation of your research problem. As I mentioned many times already in my other video lectures, I said there is no research without a research problem or a research gap. So the very first thing that you need to do when conducting research is identify your research gap or formulate your research problem. And so for, for um, if you have not yet watched my video lecture on problem formulation and gap spotting, you may refer to those important uh, lectures. And for your convenience, I provided in the description box below the link to this video lecture or this video lectures. So again, um, uh, um, as I discussed in my other two video lectures, a gap or a problem is an an answered question, issue, controversy, or untested hypothesis that has not been addressed. And the gap or the problem or the research problem is, is a part of the research, you know, that the researcher seek to address. The case of gap, the researcher seek to, seeks to fill in. In other words, the statements of the problem is a concise and concrete summary of the research problem that the researcher seeks to address. So take note again in my in my previous in my other video lecture, gap spotting and problem formulation. I discussed there the techniques on how to formulate a research problem or identify the research gap. Now my point is, once you already have the research problem or or, or once you have identified your research gap, okay. In my class, we normally have this one-page research gap. I help my students develop the research problem or the research gap. So once you have identified your research gap or, or, or once you have a researchable problem, the next thing to do is to develop, articulate that problem now. The next thing to do is to explain that problem. And that's what we meant by you explain the problem in the introductory part of your thesis or dissertation proposal. And that's what we meant by the statements of the problem. So the rationale of the study or the background of the study or the introduction of your study should articulate the statement of the problem or so it should articulate the problem that you want to see addressed in your research. So it's part of of your background of the study or your rationale of the study or your introduction. Again, I will explain this later when I go to the two samples of a statement of the problem. And for this reason, I have three major points to emphasize here. A statement of the problem first contextualizes the research problem or research gap which may involve explaining the meaning, nature, and dynamics of the topic or problem under investigation, as well as discussing what are already known about this problem and what have not been addressed so far. Okay. Second, the statements of the problem shows the relevance of the research problem or research gap and explains why the need to know more about it or why we need to address it. And third, the statement of the problem sets the main goal of the research as well as its specific objectives. So contrary to the three samples that I mentioned a while ago, the incorrect way of framing the statement of the problem, the statements, the real statement of the problem is a bit longer than the one, the example I have given to you, because it's going to be a narrative explanation of the, the, the meaning, nature, and dynamics of the problem, including the reason why we want to pursue that research and we, why we want to address that problem. And
and then we include as well the research goal and objectives. And of course, when we go to the discussion on how to write the background of the study, we also need to articulate a thesis statement. I will make another video lecture on how to frame the thesis statement because that's quite complicated. And, and um, to avoid confusion, I do not include it here. So these are the three points that we um, um, do in the statement of the problem. Okay? So, so you can see the statement of the problem is longer than the research questions and the three samples that I presented about, but must be brief and concise at the same time because the discussion doesn't have to be circuitous, long and circuitous. We need to go directly to the point. You know, after providing the context, the background of the study or the background of the topic or problem that you want to see a choice in the paper, then you immediately state the problem. That's what we're looking for in the background of the study. And it must be noted that the statement of the problem should always appear in the background of the study or rational of the study. That's what I just mentioned. Now that after we state the, uh, after we provide the background of the study, the context upon which you know, uh, um, um, our study or the research lie, the problem of the study lies, then we need to articulate the statement of the problem. In fact, some research formats in the United States, in fact, some research formats in some universities in the, United, in the United States use statement of the problem instead of the background of the study. And please take notes that in the second sample that I will present towards the end of this video lecture, I will present a, a, a statements of the problem of a PhD students of Rhode Island University in the United States. So I am giving you, I will be giving you, providing you, you with a concrete proof that what I'm trying to say here is really true. I will be providing you with concrete proof that the three samples that I just presented in the opening discussion of this video lecture are incorrect. Okay? But before I show you two samples of the statement of the problem, let me briefly explain some of the recommended steps in formulating it. So I'm now moving to the second major topic or point in this video lecture. Okay. So first step in articulating your research problem or in stating your research problem. First, you need to do problem formulation or gap spotting. And as I mentioned already, this is because there is no research without the research problem or the research gap. As I mentioned many times already, again, in my other video lectures, especially on the topic problem formulation and gap spotting, there is no research activity without a research gap. We do not do research for the sake of doing research. We do not do research because we want, we simply want to graduate from the program, Master of Arts in PhD or in something like that. And, and we thought that the thesis is just you know, a capstone, it's, it's a terminal project now, that's not the point. We do research because in the first place, we have observed a serious problem in the workplace, for example, or in your discipline that, that, that requires, that needs urgent consideration. So there is a problem out there, or there is a gap in knowledge, for example, gap in literature, gap in methodology that, that you want to fill in, that you want to see addressed. That is why you do research. Okay? And so if, if, if research is all about is first and foremost, if research is first and foremost about addressing a particular problem or identifying as, uh, uh, and filling in a gap in literature, in knowledge, then the logical thing that comes to mind is the very first thing that we need to do as researcher, as researchers, before we go to the field and gather data, before we conduct research as a whole, is to formulate your problem, identify the gap that you want to feel in your proposed research. Second, once you have formulated a research problem 
or already spotted a gap that you want to see, that you want to address in your research, you may now provide or write the background or context of your study. I will give you a sample later. Again, the next discussion, the next part will be a sample of, of a statement of the problem. And then I will drive my points in relation to this there in the discussion. So again, once you have, once you already have the research problem, once you have formulated your research problem, once you have spotted your research gap, or once you already have a research gap that you want to fill in that research, then the next thing to do is you now write your statement of the problem. You now write the background of the study, the background of the problem. You explain very briefly the context of the problem. Okay. Third, after writing the background or context of your study, study, you may now explain very briefly the problem that you want to see addressed in your research. So this is now the statement of the problem proper. This is now the articulation of the problem. So after explaining to you the context and the background of the study, then I will articulate now the problem. What really is the issue that I want to see addressed? What really in, in the study? What really is the untested hypothesis? Or what are the controversies? Or what are the gaps in knowledge that I want to fill in? And then this part, of course, may include explaining the nature and dynamics of the problem per se. So it's not just a one sentence statement of the problem, like the three samples that I just presented, you know, in the, in the opening discussion, in the, um, in the opening part of this, of this lecture, but it's going to be a narrative, full explication of the problem. But of course, it's going to be concise, you know, articulation of the problem. Fourth, once you have articulated your research problem and assuming that your readers already understand the problem as well as the need to address it, the rational, the compelling reasons as to why you need to do it, then you may now state the main goal of your study. So normally after stating the problem, as you can notice if you have watched my video lecture on how to write the background of the study, after we articulate the research problem or after we state the problem or after the statement of the problem, then the next thing to do is, then the next logical thing to do is you articulate the main goal of your research. And please take notes that whatever type of research that is that you're doing, all types of research, should only have one major goal, and the rest are simply objectives or sub goals, sub aims. Okay. And then, fifth, briefly explain what will happen if the problem is left unchecked or unaddressed. And so, in the background of the study or in the rationale of the study, you are trying to convince your part, your readers or your panel members or thesis committee members in this case, or if you're applying for a research grant, you are convincing, you're trying to convince, you know, the reviewers of the research grant that your problem is a researchable one, that it is an urgent problem that needs serious consideration, or it's a serious problem that needs urgent consideration, that your problem is one of the mega trends and recent debates in the field and so on and so forth. So you are try you you try to 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 convince the readers, the panel, the viewers that there is a need to address this problem, and so therefore the timeliness and necessity of your proposed research. And so, in the statement of the problem, once you have stated that one the, the the problem, then you explain very briefly to your readers to your panel members, to your thesis committee members, or to your reviewers of, of a research grant, that if we don't address this problem, this will happen, okay? In other words, briefly explain the main significance of your study which attempts to address a certain problem. So you explain very briefly the, ma the, the, the major, the main significance of the study. Of course, you will have a section uh, in your thesis proposal or dissertation proposal, a significance of the study, but that section of your thesis proposal will simply 
articulate the details of the significance of the study. Okay. For example, uh, your study might be beneficial to or helpful to uh, school administrators and teachers and students and parents and 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 things like that. So it, it is in that part of the thesis proposal that you will explain that part. I will make another video lecture on that because it's part of uh, it's, just, uh, it's part of 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 uh, our course of, of this uh, series of video lectures on how to write a thesis proposal. But that section, but please take note that that section of your, again, that section of your thesis proposal, the significance of the study is just a breakdown of the main significance of the study that you explain, that you articulate in the background of the study or in the rationale of the study. So you will have in the background of the study as part of the statement of the problem, you have a one statement, a sentence or two, a sentence or two maybe, you know, explaining the main contribution of your study in the in in the, the in the already existing body of knowledge, explaining very briefly the main significance of your study. For example, how it will address problem of climate change, a problem of the difficulties and challenges that teachers encounter during the pandemic, and so on and so forth. Okay? And then you also explain the possible future outcomes. You anticipate what will happen if we do not address this problem or what will, how, what will happen if we address this problem. So both the significance of the study and of course, those uh, important points that we will miss if we don't address the problem. Sixth, articulate your thesis statements, which is normally expressed in the form of an argument, claim or contention. So. Going back to the video lecture on how to write the background of the study, as I mentioned there many times already, that there are core elements to follow, the rules of thumbs to follow in writing the background of the study. And when re writing the, the background of the study or the rationale of the study, it should articulate the core elements, like articulate the major problem, that you want to see addressed in the paper or the research gap, and then articulate your research goal, and then your thesis statements. I will make a separate video lecture on how to formulate a thesis statement because this is quite uh, complicated as well. And um, um, if I'm going to insert it here, the discussion will, the video lecture will become longer and um, students are already complaining because, you know, I have the habit of explaining things in full. That is why I have this, you know, uh, longer video lectures. Anyway, there will be another video lecture on how to formulate this, the thesis statements. But again, a sixth uh, point step in the process of formulating your thesis statement is the articulation of your thesis statement, which is normally expressed in the form of an argument or a claim or contention. Don't worry, so you will be able to fully make sense of all these seven steps once I go to the two samples that I will be presenting in a while. And then the, uh, and then the, this part should explain the main reason why you wish to pursue this research. So um, the compelling reasons that why you wish to pursue your research for that particular study. So it is in the state, it is in the thesis statement part that you explain why the need to pursue this research, the main reason why there's a need to do or pursue that research. And uh, some scholars scholars call that the compelling reasons you know, why we wish to pursue the research. And lastly, seventh, you may now formulate the research questions. So take notes in writing the background of the study, you include the statement of the problem. And the major steps in writing the background of the study articulates the research problem or gap, state or articulate the research goal, articulate the thesis statement, and once you have those three major points, this is the time that you formulate the research questions. Okay. 
And so again, the resource questions is not part of the statement of the problem. No, 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 the research question is not the same with the statement of the problem. They are not the same, okay? So in fact, the research questions is part of the statement of the problem because after, again, I articulated this, the, the thesis statement, I will now state the questions, the research questions that will guide me in conducting this research. And please take note that later on, you know, these questions will be broken down further into pieces in a form of questions in your interview guide or in your interview, or if you're doing qualitative research, for example, or questions in a survey or tests, if you're doing quantitative research. Okay? So questions in the interview or in the surveys or in your questionnaires or in your tests, are based on the research questions that you articulate in the background of the study or in the first part of your thesis or dissertation proposal. And the research questions are, are simply the breakdown of your problem. Okay, to remember that one. Okay, so with this, um, I will now, so I'm now done um, explaining very briefly to you the second major point that I would like to discuss in this video lecture, that is the steps, important recommended steps in formulating the research question. So let me now go to the main uh, uh, part of this, the third main point of this discussion, that is the presentation and discussion of two samples of a statements of the problem. Let me stop sharing now and share another. The first, this is the first sample. Okay. So this is uh, as you as you can see um, the work. By the way, the working title of this proposed research is lived experiences of police officers in the Visayas region during the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and the first part, of course, this is always the first part of any type of research, is the background of the study, or sometimes some format use rational of the study. And in some universities in Europe, they use the format or the title for this section, background of the study and statements of the problem. So as you can see, there is no one size fits all in terms of naming this section of your research. It could be again called rational of the study. It can be simply called background of the study. The second sample that I will show you calls it statement of the problem. Some universities in Europe calls this background of the study and statement of the problem. That's what I'm showing it now. And in some formats, they just call it introduction of the research of, course, of the thesis of dissertation. So as we can see, there is no one size fits all format rule in framing or in, in naming this section of your research. But in writing this, section of your thesis, of your dissertation, or research, simply a research paper, there are rules to follow so that in writing this, so that you won't get lost along the way in writing it, so that you won't get a major revision from your thesis committee, from your panel. And so for, for some techniques on how to write the background of this study, um, I made three video lectures on that as part of our course, Education 505, Research Seminar and Practicum. And if you want to know more about how to write the background of the study, you may refer to the video lectures. And for your convenience, again, I provided the link um, to these video lectures in the description box below. Okay, so let me now read and discuss, if necessary, th this sample of a statements of the problem. So again, 
the title is background of the study and statements of the problem okay we could just simply say background of the study it already includes of course a statement of the problem but for some formats again they use the one i use this title to drive my points that it could be you know framed this way and before i read please take notes that before we articulate the problem of the research of this proposed research we articulate we provide first the background of the study or the context of the problem that we want to see addressed in the paper so this the first two paragraphs these two paragraphs serves uh, serve as the background of the study okay and what follows are the articulation of the problem or what follows is the statement of the problem so let me read this one now okay as we can observe the COVID-19 pandemic has reshaped the global socioeconomic and political landscape. In fact, in economic terms, according to Bob D. and Ray, the global GDP growth for 2020 has been projected to shrink by half a percentage point, that is, from 2.9% from to 2.4%. As a result, corporations, businesses, and industries need to reduce employment or temporarily close the, their doors to sustain their operations. It is also important to note that many of them were cost strapped at the start of the pandemic, which means that either they will have to drastically cut expenses, take on more loans, or file for bankruptcy. Indeed, the COVID-19 pandemic has negatively affected global business operations. See, in the first paragraph, we provided the context of the COVID-19 you know, problem in relation to the problem that we will articulate in this research. And then the second paragraph, the same economic repercussions brought about by the pandemic can be observed in the Philippines. In fact, the National Economic Development Authority reported that an estimated $86 billion in economic output was lost in 2020 alone. One major reason for this is that micro small and medium-sized enterprises represent the backbone of the Philippine economy, which are directly vulnerable to external, to external shocks, such as financial crisis, natural disasters, and changing business conditions. As Shinozaki and Rao observe, most MSMEs lacked adequate funding to remain in business after lockdowns. Again, in this first two paragraphs, we provided the context which emphasizes on the negative implication of the COVID-19 pandemic. So what we're, what we're trying to say here is uh, um, the COVID-19 pandemic does not only affect the police officers, businesses, schools, and other stakeholders in the society. What we're trying to say in the opening paragraphs is the overall picture of the negative effects of COVID-19 pandemic. So before we situate the problem, we provided the context. This is the background of the study part. Well, again, the statement of the problem is part of the background of the study, but I emphasize here that before we insert or, or situate our research problem, we provided an overall context of the problem. And then in the next paragraph, we now situate our research problem. Take notes that again, the working title is Lived Experiences of Police Officers in the Visayas Region During the COVID-19 Pandemic. So let me read this part now. This is now the second part of this section of the research paper and we, we, are, and we are now situating the statement of the problem or the problem of the proposed research okay while the adverse while the adverse impact of the covid-19 pandemic can be directly felt in the economic aspects one cannot deny the fact that its impact is multi-layered 
Indeed, the pandemic has also taken a toll on the psycho-emotional and social well-being of the people in general, most especially who are those who are working in the front lines and fighting the pandemic, such as the health workers and police officers. So when we situate here, when we articulate here the problem, we also provided the context of the problem. So there is this subcontext. Since we will be focusing on uh, on the, the police officers in Eastern Visayas, especially in Tacloban City, we also articulated here that aside from the economic, you know, uh, aside from the imp implications, the negative implications of the negative of the COVID nineteen pandemic, in the economic aspects, it it, it is all it has also taken a toll on the uh, emotion, psycho emotional world and social well being of the people, and then. In the last phrase, we now insert the police officers. So you see the gradual but logical transition from one point to the other until we have made our point. So readers can easily follow the discussion, can easily understand what we are trying to do here and why we need to do it. Because the discussion again is planned based on specific reasons. Let me continue. In fact, according to the world, in fact, according to the World Health Organization, so before I read what uh, the, the statement from World Health Organization, so I'll always take notes that what we what we made so far are bold claims based on our own interpretation or based on our own observation. But since this is research, and we need some proofs to our claim or we need some literature to corroborate our claim. And so in this case, we cite the World Health Organization. So in this case, aside from the fact that I am playing safe or that we play safe so that if somebody criticizes us or critique us, then they will be critiquing World Health Organization. Aside from that point, we also try to say that our contention, that our observation is correct because that's exactly what the World Health Organization also is saying. Okay? And that is why we inserted it here. So again, in fact, according to the World Health Organization, going to work during the pandemic, going to work during this COVID-19 pandemic has placed frontline workers under immense and unprecedented pressure, putting their physical, mental, and social well-being at risk. So as you can see, our claim here is exactly the same with the claim of the World Health Organization. So again and again and again, we made a contention first, and then we let an authority, a source, support, corroborate our claim. And so in that case, our point, our observation is reliable. Our data is correct, not questionable. And then we continue, according to the uh, according to the WHO, if exposed to excessive uh, if exposed to excessive stress due to prolonged periods of work, then these frontline workers may experience mental disorders such as depression and anxiety, which in turn result in unhealthy behaviors like excessive smoking, drinking, and even substance abuse. Before I proceed, let me emphasize this one again. So this is the statements of the problem. The rest, of course, is part of the statement of the problem. But in this case, we now show to our readers what the problem really is. And if we summarize the problem, of course, there is the pandemic and it has taken a toll on the economic financial standing of the country, but also at the same time, it has taken a toll on the psycho, emotional, and social well-being of the people. And some of the, the people that are directly impacted by the pandemic or who directly suffer from the pandemic are the frontliners like the healthcare workers and the police officers. See? And we said that these people are suffering, you know, are exposed to extreme risk mentally, physically, and emotionally. And so therefore, uh, and we mentioned here, as I mentioned in the, in the, in the, the steps in, in formulating the statement of the problem, as we articulate here, we explain what will happen 
if this problem is left unchecked. And we explain here as well the major significance of our research if we pursue this research. That is, if we determine the lived experiences of these police officers, or in other words, if we determine the challenges and difficulties that the, 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 the challenges and difficulties that they encounter on a daily basis. Because when we when when we articulate the thesis statement later in, towards the end of this of this of this uh, background of the study, we will argue that that's the reason why we need to determine the lived experiences of these police officers so that once we know the challenges and difficulties, we will be we will be in the best position to offer some alternatives or solution to the problem. That's how we exactly formulate the research problem. That's we how we exactly state the problem of the research, not just that, you know, one sentence or um, the statement of the problem with a one sentence before stating the research questions. Let me continue. This is uh, let me let me read again the first sentence so that you will uh, to, to establish the momentum of the discussion. So again, uh, according to uh, according to the uh, according to the WHO, if exposed to excessive stress due to prolonged periods of work, then these frontline workers may experience mental disorders. Uh, such as depression and anxiety, which in turn result in unhealthy behaviors like excessive smoking, drinking, and even substance abuse. So notice again how serious the problem is. Uh, and so therefore, there's a need to do this research. This explains why Billings and others in their work titled Experiences of Frontline Healthcare Workers and their views about support uh, during COVID-19 pandemic and previous pan pandemic, a systematic review and qualitative meta-synthesis argue that we need to learn from the experiences of the frontline workers so we will not only provide moral and medical support to them, but also come up with strategies to address the problem in case it may arise in the future. See, See the importance of conducting this research see the importance of determining the lived experiences of police officers during the COVID-19 pandemic. They are suffering from the trace, they're prone to mental disorder, their social, psycho-emotional and social well-being is threatened. And so we need to, again, determine the challenges and difficulties because again, that will put us in the best position to offer some strategies, solutions, alternatives to the problem they encounter. So far, I hope that you can see how important, how serious the problem here. And as I mentioned in the, in the steps, in the previous discussion, the, the second major point in this video lecture, after we have articulated the problem, the research problem or research gap, the next thing to do is articulate the research goal. And this is exactly what we do here. Okay? And it reads, it is for this reason, therefore, that this proposed policy research aims to determine the lived experiences of police officers in the Visayas region in the Eastern Visayas region, in the Eastern Visayas region, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's our major goal, okay? The major goal of the research, which is directly in line with the working title, is that the proposed policy research aims to determine the lived experiences of police officers in the Eastern Visayas regions during the COVID-19 pandemic. And in what follows, we explain the problem and the goal further before we articulate the thesis statement. Let me continue. Based on the initial interview with some of the police officers in Tacloban City, the researchers found out that many of the said police officers have been facing difficulties and challenges during the COVID-19 pandemic, most especially in their effort to keep the community, community safe from the deadly virus. 
So we provided an explanation, further explanation to put the problem and the research goal further in context. So that's our problem will not appear as if it is formulated out of, formulated in a vacuum. In fact, many of them felt that their physical health is most at risk when they assign when they are assigned in checkpoint areas. This paranoia has been compounded by the sad by the sad news that of the 41,701 police officers infected by the virus as of as of October 27, 2021, the death toll stands at 123. Another reason why we need uh, another point that I would like to emphasize here is that, um, you know, before we write our background of the study, we conducted initial observations and interviews first with with some of some of the police officers in the region. So that what we are trying to say here, what the facts, the information, the data that we provided here are are factual, not based on opinion, because this is research. This is supposed to be scientific. There's supposed to be scientific rigor in the way we frame our sentences, the way we conduct our research as a whole. Let me continue. Indeed, we can only imagine how stressed our police officers are because of this pandemic. And then, after I, I mentioned, as I mentioned in these steps on how to formulate the thesis problem, this statement, no, sorry, as I mentioned in the previous discussion on the steps in uh, uh, the recommended step on how to formulate a statement of the problem. After we, again, articulate the research problem, we articulate the research goal. And what we, done, we, have, what we have done so far is articulate the research goal. Now, after articulating the research goal, I said in the previous section, articulate the thesis statement. And this include discussing or articulating what will happen if the, if the problem is left unchecked. And this is part of the main significance of the study. It reads, if this problem is left unchecked, then we run the risk of putting our police officers at extreme mental and physical risk, which may result in depression, poor performance of their duties, and other related risks. So put conversely, if we address the problem, if we determine their lived experiences and provide strategies, solutions, recommendations, then we will be able to avoid this depression, poor performance of the duties, and other related risks. That's how significant this, this proposed research is. That's how important this study is, not just to the police officers, but also to people, to, 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 to people in general, especially those who are involved in you know, fighting the COVID-19 pandemic, like the frontliners in general. And then we proceed. Again, this rationale motivates the researchers to determine the lived experiences of, of police officers in the Visayas region during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we just simply rehash the goal. We re-emphasize it so that our readers will understand what we are doing and why we are doing it. And then the last, sentence before the state before the research questions this is premised on the idea that this is premised on the idea that once the researchers know the difficulties and challenges that these police officers encountered in the discharge of the duties during the pandemic then they will be in the best position to offer alternatives or solutions to the problem that's it that's how we state the problem of the research this is exactly statement of the problem. 
this is the statements of the problem. The whole stretch of this background of the study is the statements of the problem. And I hope I have proven to you my point that the three samples that I, I presented in the introductory part of this lecture are incorrect. That those are not statements of the problems, but they are simply research questions. And I hope I have explained in full to you the point that statements of the problem on the one hand and research questions on the other hand are not the same, that they do that we should not collapse the two, okay? And in fact, after the statement of the problem in this case, we now state the research questions. So after, after that one, we could simply, we could easily write, or we could easily say, this study will be guided by the following questions. Question number one, because this is a, a, a qualitative uh, research. This is um, using phenomenological uh, research design. We could only have two major questions here. You don't have to have too many questions here. And, uh, and, and, and the question, the common question, what is the profile of the respondent in terms of blah, blah, blah? We don't need it here. We just need to go directly to the point. And by the way, I will make another video lecture on how to formulate the research questions. So I will not include it here. I, let me just explain to you that after the statements of the problem, then I may now in the best position to articulate or formulate the research questions. And as you can see, and as I already mentioned already, the research questions are parts of the statements of the problem, okay? So after reading this, after the first set, after the last sentence of the background of the study, then I may now, um, um, we could, I may now say, uh, this study will be guided with the following questions. Question number one: What are the challenges and difficulties that the police officers in the Visayas regions encountered during the pandemic? And question number two: How do these police officers cope with the problem? So as you can see, these two questions are enough for me to say that these are the questions <laughs> I would, these are the major questions that we will address in the study. That these are the two major questions as a result of the main problem that, they ha that we have. So these are the breakdown. These two questions are a breakdown of the major problem that we just have presented. Okay? And then later on, when we formulate our interview questions in the semi-structured interview guide that we have, for example, then the questions that we will formulate there will be based here. Okay? So those questions will be directly in line with the research questions. So that at the end of the day, there is really coherence in our coherence and consistency in the study, okay? So, and after that, of course, once, um, once we, in a qualitative uh, research, sometimes um, the background of the study or the background of the study and statement of the problem is followed by a literature review or review of related literature. In some formats, they make a review of related literature as chapter two that depends, of course, on the policy or the format, format of your university. But in our case, after the background of the study, we provided uh, right away the review of related literature. I will make another video lecture on that as part of this series of video lectures on how to write uh, um, a thesis proposal or a dissertation, thesis or dissertation proposal. So at this point, I hope um, you have already, I hope you have learned 
or I hope you already know the major difference between research statement of the problem and research questions. And I hope you have fully understood again why the three samples of a statement of the problem that I presented in the introductory part of this lecture, again, are incorrect. Uh, before I end this video lecture, let me share with you another sample to prove my point that sometimes the, the, the background of the study is called the statement of the problem. So let me share this one. So this is sample two. I will just read this sample and I will do some side discussion because uh, I, I did not write this one. So this is coming from uh, Karen L. Capraro, a PhD student. Oh, I, I'm sure she already graduated um, from the University of Rhode Island in the United States. So the working title, uh, the title of her dissertation is an explanatory case study of the implementation of co-teaching as a student teaching method. And then, as you know, this in their format, this is their own format. You, you don't need to follow this format. What I'm trying to show here to you is that what I'm, is to prove the point that the background of the study can sometimes be called the statement of the problem. But before that, look, um, this is chapter one of in their formats. This is already Rhode Island University, the University of Rhode Island is a, one of the famous, one of the most famous and prestigious universities in the United States, of course. So they have this chapter one and part of the chapter one is a statement of the problem. And then you have chapter two, uh, the literature review, but I don't uh, need to explain that part. You see chapter one and she has the statement of the problem here in their format. So let me just read this one before I end this video lecture. Okay. So here, take note, all of this is statements of the problem. Okay. So again and again and again, the three samples that I presented in the opening, in the introductory part of this discussion are incorrect. So it's about time that we need to check, we need to correct our misconceptions in research, some of our misconceptions in research, we need to correct our bad practices in research. So let me read this one. Again, an explanatory case study of the implementation of co-teaching as a student teaching method. Chapter one, introduction, statements of the problem. Demands on teachers in the 21st century continue to rise as standards for learning and accountability swell amidst a population of school children with increasingly diverse needs. While states scramble to adapt and implement the common core standards in an attempt to make our nation's needy students, college and career study, research has continually shown that the biggest influence on student academic growth is the quality of the teacher, not socioeconomic status, not family background, but the quality of the teacher. I hope you see the problem here that Karen uh, tried to articulate. In fact, Teacher quality surpasses a multitude of classroom variables, including previous achievement level of students, class size as it is currently operationalized, heterogeneity of, heterogeneity of students, and the ethnic and socioeconomic makeup of the classroom. The U.S. Department of Education estimates that schools and Department of Education produce about 220,000 certified teachers each year with 90% of those educated in universities. Remarkably, despite evidence related to teacher quality and the changing needs of the student population, teacher education programs at the college and university levels have remained largely unchanged. Unconspicuously ill-defined. In fact, research relative to teacher education emerged as an identifiable field separate from research and teaching only during the last half century. 
increased to research in teacher education at the university level is thus essential for preparing the teachers, for preparing the teachers, our nation, for preparing the teachers our nation needs today. Perhaps the most critical aspect of teacher education is the student teaching experience. She's introducing now the problem, it's explaining further the problem. Yet, strangely, student teaching practices have remained largely unchanged since the 1920s. And there is still little evidence for what works. Recently, teacher educators have begun to explore co-teaching as an alternative to the traditional student teaching model. Co-teaching differs from traditional student teaching in that the co-teaching partners, namely the classroom teacher and the pre-service teacher, work at one another's elbow where the, where the pre-service teacher is learning to teach by participating in collective practice. Although co-teaching has been frequently employed in the special education domain, its use during student teaching is a practice in its infancy and its application in the student teaching experience is a new area of study. Advocates of, advocates of co-teaching as an alternative student teaching method claim there are many benefits, including opportunities to vary content uh, presentation, individualized instruction, scaffold learning experiences, monitor students' understanding, realize increased growth relative to student achievement, and increase um, democratization of teaching. Uh, Wassel and Lavan stipulate, however, that all stakeholders have three have a three fundamental understanding of the model prior to co-teaching in order to develop successful partnerships. Cook and Friend concur, adding that while preparation for co-teaching is necessary in clarifying expectations, it is also essential for for implementation. And then. Patton observed that if one had to choose between implementation information and outcomes information, there are many instances, instances in which implementation information would be of greater value. Although much has been written about the necessity of preparation essential to the success of co-teaching uh, partnership, partnerships and the, uh, and the potential benefits, very little has been written about how co-teaching as a student teaching method is, actual, uh, is actually executed or implemented in, real, in the real classroom. So it is here that it is in this um, sentence that Karen summarizes the research problem or the research gap that she wants to see addressed in the paper or in, the, in her dissertation. An area of consideration is therefore implementation. Okay. She will focus on this. And then, and then, after the statements, so this is exactly the statements of the problem. As we can see, you can search this in the internet if you want. But anyway, this is the work of uh, um, Karen Caprado. So after the statements of the problem, this one, so look, look, see, that's how long the statement of the problem here is compared to the statement of the problem, the incorrect statement of the problem that I just presented, the introductory part again of this lecture, but at the same time concise, of course. Okay? And after the statement of the problem, um, Karen's format has this. She has purpose of the study as, you know, um, the second section of this introduction to her dissertation. So the purpose of this study, the purpose of this case study. So in, in, in my sample, in the previous sample, I incorporated this in the background of the study and stated the problem in the form of a research goal. But in her for, format, um, there's a separate, separate section on the goal, the main goal of the study, okay? purpose of the study. You can, this is, of course, um, as I said, there is no one size fits all format or standard in, in doing this. So. So this is, it is here where Karen articulated the research goal, her research goal. Let me continue. And then uh, after articulating the research goal, um, the uh, formulation of the research questions. So, um, um, it reads, 
The purpose of this case study then was to understand how co-teaching was implemented in seven elementary and early childhood classrooms in a mid-sized New England city in an effort to explore alternative models for student teaching in the university setting and to the limited research available relative to teacher education. See? In our context, in the Philippine context, we thought that this is already the statement of the problem. No, this is just the goal. This is not the statement of the problem. Karen simply state here, articulated here, the main goal of the study and the statement of the problem are, again, this one. See? And then after stating the purpose of the study or the main goal of the research, then Karen says, the study also sought explanation as to why differences in implementation, if any, exist. And then she wrote, to explore these issues, this case study was guided by the following two questions relative to implementation. Question number one, how is co-teaching implemented in seven elementary and early childhood classrooms? Question number two, if differences in implementation are found, why do these differences exist? So I want to emphasize this one. There are only two questions here, especially that this is a qualitative research. We don't need to have a lot of questions like what is the profile of the respondents in terms of age, economic status, educational background, things like that. We need that questions if we are doing quantitative research, most particularly well, if you're doing quantitative research, and most particularly if we are employing correlational research design, we want to make a correlation between two or more variables. And if you're talking about, for example, performance of students in during the pandemic, so in that study, it's it's understandable, of course, it's appropriate that we need to determine the profile of the respondents, the students in this case, because their background will definitely affect the performance, like if the like economic background of the students, the context, the 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 the, the, the social context. For example, the students coming from the rural areas. So performance of students coming from Rural areas and urban areas are completely di di different and, and, and in terms of economic standing. You know? Most of the time, I don't want to sound biased, but rich people, well-off family tends to, well-off students, well-off uh, students or students coming from well-off families tend to perform well, of course, because they were have been trained or educated in, in expensive schools, exclusive schools, where they were trained thoroughly in terms of grammar, in terms of history, in terms of logic and intelligence, things like that. So it's in it's most of the time in quantitative research, most particularly in correlational research design, that we have the question, what is the profile of the respondents in terms of blah, blah, blah. But in qualitative research, like in case study, phenomenological research design, grounded theory, in ethnography, we don't need to ask that question. So what I'm trying to point here is in in Karen's um, dissertation there are just two questions so we don't we don't need to have more and Karen is not asking about the profile of the respondents that's all for now I hope um, my discussion makes sense and I hope you have learned something from this video lecture more next time when I go to the discussion on how to formulate research questions. Thank you very much and I wish you all the best. Bye-bye.